So I'm Jackie Warnemont. I'm in the Department of English. I'm a Lincoln Center uh, Applied Ethics Fellow and the founding, a uh, founding co-director of uh, HS CoLab here with my uh, co-founding co-director, Jessica Rajko. <laughs> that was a lot of co's. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about today is um, a project that is uh, a sort of speculative project for me right now, very experimental, um, and one that is, has been deeply collaborative. Um, so I'll be sort of pointing to lots of different people um, over the course of the talk. But the title for today is What Do We Owe the Dead Sound, Touch, and Arrhythmic Algorithmic Accountability? Um, so I'd like to begin with a bit of history. Uh, in the 20th century, roughly 64,000 people in the United States, mainly patients in state asylums and hospitals, were sterilized based on eugenics laws. A number of excellent books and articles and a few web resources on the history of eugenics and sterilization have appeared in recent years, but very little is known about the demographics and experiences of people sterilized, often against their will or under duress. Eugenics, or the effort to shape and limit populations uh, through sterilization and other forms of reproductive control, has been in the news recently. Earlier this year, and this is actually, this would be in 2015, uh, Virginia joined North Carolina in offering monetary reparations to people sterilized under state eugenics programs in the 20th century. Last summer, No Mas Bebes, a new documentary about Los Angeles County General Hospital's sterilization abuse against Latinas, premiered at the Los Angeles Film Festival. And just two years ago, excuse me, in 2013, uh, in July 2013, while this documentary was in production, an investigative journalist at the Center for Investigative Reporting published an in-depth article claiming that about 150 female inmates in California prisons had received unauthorized tubal ligations. This was confirmed with an exhaustive state audit issued last summer and a bill signed by Governor Jerry Brown prohibiting sterilizations in state prisons except in cases of medical emergency was issued. In 1907, Indiana became the first of more than 30 states to adopt legislation aimed at compulsory sterilization of certain individuals. Although the law was overturned by the Indiana Supreme Court in 1921, the US Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of a Virginia law allowing for the compulsory sterilization of patients of state mental institutions in 1927. Some states sterilized what were known as imbeciles for much of the 20th century. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the 1927 uh, Beck, Buck versus Bell case that the state of Virginia could in fact sterilize individuals under the Virginia Sterilization Act of 1924. And for our purposes, we can think of the, the sort of most significant era of eugenic sterilization as between 1907 and 1963. Now I'm working at uh, are with collaborators at the University of Michigan, um, in particular Alexandra Mina Stern, who is a historian of science, and her team on a multimodal project to capture and illuminate demographic patterns and individual experiences of eugenic sterilization over four decades in California. This project incorporates data and documents connected to a long history of eugen eugenics and coerced sterilization in state institution, and in particular among marginalized communities. Uh, and that our, our sort of uh, archive encompasses from the early 1900s to the present. This digital project will build on the foundation of our eugenic sterilization data set, incorporating a variety of digital tools and interpretive devices. And what I'm talking about here today is just really a very small portion of this work. In this project, we have a unique resource of nearly 20,000 patient records from California institutions from 1921 to 1953. These records were microfilmed by the California Department of State Hospitals in the 1970s and were only recently discovered. Stern and her team at Michigan have digitized these reels and are using them in compliance with state and university regulations to create what's known as a de-identified data set. Our database includes patient records that include 212 discrete variables culled from almost 30,000 individual documents. The resource is the first of its kind, encompassing almost one-third of the total sterilizations performed in the 32 uh, states in the U.S. in the 20th century. Now part of the challenge of making these histories visible is a set of national guidelines regarding the release of medical data, which is considered protected information. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, also known as HIPAA, was designed in part to protect the confidentiality and security of healthcare information. 
but the law is also a tool to obscure histories and contemporary accounts of reproductive injustice and discrimination. Violations of human rights in the areas, <clears throat> in the arenas of reproductive, of reproduction and health, particularly, my tongue, particularly of vulnerable, often minority populations in the United States is not new. But these practices remain largely out of public view until investigative journalists and community activists are able to break through the silence. Thus far, traditional scholarly work with protected information has sought to create what are known as composite models in order to tell stories of injustice without violating privacy. These models can uh, reduce individual experience to a false collective imagined experience and lack the resonance needed to transform public awareness and policy making. So one of the goals of this project is to develop new modalities that can replace composites. Um, and this is a primary concern for our upcoming workshops and prototyping processes. And these are, there's a, a very long list actually of what constitutes individually identifiable health information. But among um, the easiest to sort of think of as, as information that you might want both to keep private but also in order to tell a very compelling history is any identifying thing about a person's past, present, future, physical or mental health, anything regarding the provision of health care to that individ individual, anything regarding payment um, for the provision of health care to that individual, and any individually identifying information, which can be things like name, address, birth, date, uh, of sterilization, for example, social security numbers. So we're not able to, um, for example, if we have a very unique individual uh, in the data set, who has, say, you know, five markers that aren't represented well in the, the rest of the data set, we can't talk about that person at all, right? So the general um, practice in epidemiology and uh, health statistics is to think about or to talk about only those which there are at least five examples of. So anything sub five you can't talk about. Yeah? So there's some information out there that are, there's uh, some discrepancy about or disagreement, if that's a better word, about sterilization of American Mm -hmm. um, would that be something that you're able to, so the discrepancy is American Indian women's story is that this happened to a lot of American Indian women and Indian Health Service or Indian Service um, prior to that say that no, you know, you're not correct. So are you able to hone in on that or is that something that you would have to restrict based upon HIPAA policy? So Anything, according to HIPAA regulations, and the federal guidelines changed recently, it's within 50 years of the death of an individual. So anybody who was sterilized any time after 1920, it's pretty much um, covered under HIPAA regulations. Um, the, there are issues, we could certainly look at large aggregate data, um, but one of the things that we've run into um, in the case of looking at, say, Arizona's sterilization practices, is that I actually can't even get access to the archives. Um, and this is a, a common issue. Um, there's a woman named Johanna Stern who did, who has a really amazing book on this. She was researching uh, North Carolina sterilizations, and those records were actually destroyed by the state when they discovered what she was doing. Um, so this is why I say some of this is, is being hidden under the Aegeus of uh, HIPAA regulations. So we could certainly get at larger issues, but we couldn't get at individual stories necessarily. And we would have to have access to those records, period. Yeah? Just to clarify, all this information is in the record. I mean, you can see who. Yes. See the individuals. You're just not yes. prohibited by law from identifying them. That's right. OK. Um, so I'm. Part of what I'm going to talk about here is my own sort of what I think of as a kind of braid of methods, um, which come out of a, a couple of different disciplines. Literary studies and archival practices, thinking about performance and performance theory, and then archival theory. So I had been thinking <coughs> about performance as a useful way um, in order to think about how archives are activated and activatable. But working with the eugenics archive had pushed me to think really quite hard about the intellectual underpinnings of my own sense of melancholy around archival absence. I was often sort of lamenting the things that weren't there in the archives. As a 17th century scholar, this was very, and there's a lot that's not in the archives. Um, and in 2011, I heard Morris Eves give a talk titled The Editorial Void, Notes Toward a Study of Oblivion in which he asked, I think very provocatively, how might we edit the missing? And his argument 
is that it's a kind of natural feature of archives and technology that dispersal and disposal are the normal fate of information when it hits a generational border. So I began looking for ways of thinking not only in terms of loss and lossiness, but also in terms of possibilities and opportunities, a kind of methodological equivalent of highlighting what is there rather than simply stomping my feet and protesting that nothing is there. And in the context of Shakespeare studies, Simon Palfrey has recently suggested thinking about literary and historical records in terms of fractals. And I want to just pin that Waichi Dimmock advanced a similar argument on behalf of a larger literary history in her 2006 Through Other Continents. Um, but Palfrey's formulation is particularly quotable. He suggests thinking of the fractal nature of the archival record as, quote, in one sense, an insufficient shard of the true substan substance, and in another sense, a promise crammed instantiation of everything. And it's this tension between the insufficient shard and the promise crammed instantiation of everything that is really instructive and productive for me. A kind of expression of both the limits and the possibilities inherent in archival trans transmission. A way then perhaps of subverting my own melancholic sense of loss and of seeing that discussions of privacy and right to be forgotten might actually bear on non 20th century archives. At the same time, however, I have turned back, or I have turned towards performance theory in part to, as Rebecca Schneider suggests, push back against the long standing assumption in archive culture that objects, documents, and recordings are the only ways of remaining, and that monuments are the best mode of commemorating. Performance based archival theory and practice rejects an imperial and patriarchal logic that assumes that it, if it is not visible, or given to documentation uh, or sonic recording or otherwise houseable in Derrida's terms that in an archive, then it is somehow lost or disappeared. And this is Diana Taylor, um, who is quoted by Rebecca Schneider. She said, there's an advantage to thinking about a repertoire performed through dance, theater, song, ritual, witnessing, healing practices, memory paths, and the many other forms of repeatable behaviors as something that cannot be housed or contained in the archive. So I've been working through a kind of methodological braid, literary editing a la Eves and Dimock, of Taylor's push to think through the archive as a repertoire, as an array of non-tangible holdings. And then also uh, there's a, an archive scholar named T.K. Sangwon who's been working on post or non-custodial uh, collections. Um, and she's been thinking about this in particularly in relation to human rights uh, abuses and violations. How, how does one document those when often it's not possible to have a kind of collection or holding um, in the classical sense. Um, and so TK has been um, foregrounding belongings and bodies, right? So belongings rather than collections or documents um, and thinking about uh, a kind of archival practice that doesn't insist on holding the thing in a, in a repository. So pulling these threads together, I'm working towards an ethic and a practice not necessarily of recovery, but one of care, an ethic of holding space for the traces that are present and thinking about how we might know them in more embodied ways. Um, as I said, and this is uh, part of a, a larger project that I'm doing with Jessica Rajko and Eileen Stanley, who are both here at ASU, um, titled Safe Harbor. An ethics of care and ethics of holding space is, is an important part of what we're trying to think through in that project. So what I'd like to do now uh, with your indulgence is to ask you all um, to participate in a kind of performative uh, experiment in some way. Um, this is a, a, I describe it as a kind of performative gesture, a first prototype effort that uh, maybe points us towards the kind of thing that we're talking about here. So what I'm gonna do is ask us to think first about sound. Now of that large archive that I talked about, the 20,000 sterilizations, over 30,000 records, I have sonified a very, very, very small subset. So I took the first two years, right, of an over 50 year data set. And I'm looking, I said there were 212 different uh, values in each record. We're looking at just two gender, male, female, and consent, consent or non-consent. So we have four different categories, right? We can have male plus consent, 
female plus consent, male without consent, and female without consent. And what you have there is a kind of visual map of the sonification that I'm about to play for you. there were uh, 100 different values. Um, over each value had a single second in the, son in the sonification rate, so you had 100 seconds of either female consenting, male consenting, non-consent uh, for both. So now what I'd like to ask you to do is to experience this as a haptic or touch-based um, moment. And just to give you a real quick haptics, uh, right, is a tactile experience, a knowing through touch or skin. So if you all will do me the favor of getting up and assembling yourselves on either side of this red wire. And for those who are coming around this way, watch out for this cord. I don't want anybody to die. <laughs> so what you have here are uh, two small devices that are known as woojers. They're considered small subwoofers. Um, and this is part of what Jessica and I and Eileen have been using both in our Vibrant Lives project, but also here and in the Safe Har Harbor project. Um, I've used the wire there. It's just a piece of enameled wire um, so that you can feel, more of you can feel this, right? Essentially, so we can have a group experience because you can hold a wooger and feel the vibration. But if I had to hand it all around to you, you would miss out on some part of it. So the one thing to know about in this particular configuration is that this is about right sound waves traveling through a medium. And so if you were to rest your fingers or grab, rest your fingers heavily or grab onto the wire, you would dampen the signal for the other people uh, along the wire. So I encourage you to rest your fingers very lightly. If you go ahead and do that, I'll play that same sonified bit for you. 
So thank you all for coming up and doing that. Um, I'm particularly interested, and I hope we'll have plenty of time to talk about this, the ways in something uh, like this might in fact enact performances syncopated time or be understood as akin to Toni Morrison's notion of rememory or Adrian Rich's notion of revision. Uh, for me, performance helps to orient us away from thinking about data and archives as something upon which we act and toward the idea that data and archives are already acting. We might think about engaging, re-engaging, remembering, and revisioning data actively, that is, involving or entangling ourselves with the data, and in the process, recognizing the way that bodies, labor, affect, and culture are always present, but are also sort of important sites for non-monumental history. And for me, this is where the algorithmic accountability portion of my title comes to bear. When Soraya Shamali or Nick Diakopoulos talk about algorithmic accountability, they're talking about the tools that make it possible to hold algorithms accountable for the decisions and outcomes they produce, things like illegal gender bias in hiring practices or a political bias in a Google search. I'm using it a bit differently here to point to the ways in which we can share the history of eugenics under the HIPAA regulations um, the only ways that we can do that must be algorithmic in some sense. Getting the story out, as it were, depends on our ability to craft processes and procedures that can sort through a large data set in order to reveal localized and larger patterns. We're depending on algorithmic translation between media, a kind of remediation, to craft a compelling experience of this history. And this is what I would call algorithmic accountability by way of algorithm rather than accountability of the algorithm. And with this algorithmic accountability, we might also imagine that to engage the archive, to engage data, is to pledge ourselves as responsible for the kinds of knowledge and subject positions that our data and archival efforts engender. That is to intervene in modes of preserving and building knowledge that are producing and have produced inequality. So, I, yeah, you have a question? I'm back to the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. Who interpreted what was found into sound? I did. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you considered other modes of uh, representing this, for example, light and color mm -hmm. or other, uh, uh, other ones? Yeah, so this project is nine months old, mm -hmm. maybe? Um, and among the things that we've been talking about are not simply small devices like this, but larger devices, uh, sculpture, sculptural devices. We've been playing with um, the way that sound works very differently in wood. Um, for example, large pieces of wood kind of sing the sound in ways that are different. Um, we've been talking about using light and sound and touch all together. And one of the things that I would like your feedback on, if you don't mind, is the experience of having the two separated. I've given uh, a version of this talk at a couple of different uh, venues and people have very different reactions. Some people really like the sonification, which today didn't play perfectly. I could replay it on my phone um, if anybody was interested. Um, some people really felt like the haptic was very powerful and some people thought that the marriage of the two was powerful and other people just wanted visualization, right? Um, so I think for me, part of what's interesting is thinking about lots of different modalities of representing this while also maintaining that kind of um, anonymity that the HIPAA regulations require of us. Yeah, I have a, kind of an archival theory question. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times when, whether it's a research project or something else draws on archives for data, um, you know, I think there's been many a time when like a historian has taken something in the archive as the truth with a capital T mm -hmm. kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of thinking about kind of like al algorithmic accountability, I was also thinking about kind of algorithmic bias and the idea that the data set, I'm assuming, are doctor's records, patient's records, mm -hmm. so mainly told from the perspective of the doctors. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about what, how that biases the data set. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of thinking in contrast to, I'm sure you're familiar with this project, it's called Nomás Bebés. Yes, the, the movie that I was talking about. Oh, yeah. oh sorry, I came in late. It's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and how that is, um, so, so on one hand, you have this very like uh, decontextualized or de-identified data set that has to be so, due to HIPAA, um, and you have this other really personalized uh, data set, really small group of women that really relies on 
oral narrative mm -hmm. um, to get it through. And so I guess I was just thinking about how in the, this is not a visualization, but in the sonification, you know, haptic, ha what do you call it? Haptic, Haptics. Haptifying of the uh -huh. archive, if you thought about addressing the materials from which you create those yes. um, interactions and the biases within those materials. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so among the things, right, that we definitely aren't taking those records as um, representative, like I wouldn't say that I'm giving voice to those sterilized, for example, right, because um, there are very few ways in which we could uh, construe highly normalized medical records mm -hmm. as the voices of the patients, right? Um, we do have some protest letters um, where people are, are writing in their own hand, um, and so that would be a slightly different case, but I think there's a, a whole um, sort of nexus of issues around who is speaking and under what conditions. So for example, uh, let's make my computer go away. Um, the, uh, the sonification and haptification that we had here, right, two, it's just two years of the data set, right? So only 110 records, roughly. Um, even in that small set, pulling it down, abstracting it to male, female, consent, non-consent, mm -hmm. has lots of problems in it, right? There were plenty of women um, who would have chosen and in fact pursued sterilization as a birth control method, right? Um, so we can't say, uh, you know, the, the consent isn't um, unmediated in some way, right? right? Um, it, it's under duress in some way, I think. Um, there's also the issue of non-consent. It may not be that people actively refuse to give consent, but we just don't have a record of it. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that um, people who did consent didn't want to, but it was the only way to be um, discharged from the hospital, right? So they're all in mental institutions. And if you were sterilized, you could then be discharged. Um, so I think there's a, the, the question of, of what are we doing when we abstract is a really important one. Mm -hmm. And the No Mas Bebes example I think is really interesting because that's a, an occasion where six women came to tell their own stories, mm -hmm. right? This is an instance where we have an archival collection of 20,000 records that were left abandoned in a building. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's, like a, it's like looking at things from a, a very different perspective. And we even have, um, Alex has been contacted by a family member who is represented in that data set and legally she cannot share the information with that family member, mm -hmm. right? So like there's a, a problem of, it's not a problem, there's a, um, a set of restrictions that face any researcher, I think, depending on where they're coming from when they're trying to tell that story. So we're absolutely aware of that um, and trying to think about it. And I think one of the things that we're interested in is what those medical records do to the people that they're, they're narrating mm -hmm. in some way, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot there that, that can be teased out. Mm -hmm. So I think my, where I had difficulty is understanding what each sound correlated to. Mm -hmm. So is it number of persons, is it male mm -hmm. uh, with consent, male without consent? So. You know, you assigned a tone. Is that what you, how you did it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I did it in order to optimize being able to feel it, right? And th so the lowest two tones are non-consent from both genders, and the highest ones are consent from both genders. So if I play it again, and it, the playback on the computer was not particularly effective. Right, so those low ones are male non-consent. So we actually have a high number of male non-consent sterilizations in this first two years. That one is a female non-consent, right? And so in some way, um, it's important to recognize the arbitrariness of that tone with that value, right? We have values that we're trying to map in both like visual, tactile, and sonic space and they had to be pulled apart in some way in order to make them more legible. It's actually, if we had had, I had them in a first draft or a first version of the sonification quite close together and you couldn't distinguish um, when it came to the haptics between different values. But as, as an observer who doesn't know the scale that you're using or whatever mm -hmm. you're assigning, I mean, it just helps to know, and you know, is that a sorrowful, when you hear the deep tone, is that a time when I ought to feel sorrow or I want to feel sorrow? 
or could it be something that you know uh, is the reverse? So, mm -hmm. uh, in my mind, I assign what I think I want to feel mm -hmm. to that, but I didn't know the scale, so it's good to know <coughs> each sound. Yeah, represents. and you know, I think um, the question of of what you ought to feel is an interesting one, and I'm not sure that I want to tell you what you ought to okay. feel. Right? Uh, <laughs> you know, and I, I actually had someone, um, when I gave this talk at uh, the University of Kansas, say to me, I really appreciate how minimalist it is because you're not trying to hack my body, right? You're not trying to hijack my senses and make me feel something. But of course, right, the, the lower tone, I want that to resonate, right? right? The, the non-consensual sterilization, I want it to resonate. And we have affective and epistemological associations with deep, low tones, right? So in some way, there's, there's, there's not a way of getting away from that, um, but it's something to sort of be cognizant of and sit with. Well, and you pointed, I'm sorry, you pointed out that not all of the ones that were without consent, it may truly not be without consent. It right. just may be poor record keeping or whatever. Right. Um, so it's difficult to assign your own feelings to it, but it helps to know what it is. If you're, so, if it were the reverse, if it were those with consent that were at the lower notes, then I would feel a disconnect between what I am emoting sure. and what I am hearing or feeling. Right. What was the the two year time period? So it's the first two years of our record, so nineteen twenty one to nineteen twenty three. Okay. All of that prior to the war crimes trials at Nuremberg, yep. in which informed consent became an internationally accepted yeah. approach. So I think that historical fact makes a difference in terms of the ethical foundation, perhaps. But my, okay, I just had to say that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they did, California had a standard of informed consent that wasn't the same, but they had a model one that they were supposed to be working with. Right, and, and I think your key word there is supposed. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, my, my question to you was, I was in sort of taken with your title. Mm -hmm. What do we owe the dead? Mm -hmm. And I've yet to hear an answer. What do you believe we do owe to the dead as we are looking at all of these data sets? Well, I think in this particular case, this is part of what I was talking about with the, the sort of ethics of care and of holding space, that part of what I'm exploring with this is how can we hold space for and feel in our bodies a, a, a phenomenon that happened historically, right? Um, because I think very often, right, I could, I could tell you the numbers, and in fact I did, right? I can say that these things existed, say that these situations existed, I can create those composite models, right? Mm -hmm. um, and people have done that, and, and those are good books. Um, but there's something about the way that we take in sort of narrative visual data um, that is different, I think, than when you have to sit for 110 seconds touching a wire to feel the data of, of a historical event. For me, that feels different. And, and I don't know that I, I, I'm not in a situation yet where I can say I think this absolutely does X. I'm not sure I'll ever be there because this is brand new. Um, but I think this um, being present with traces of people is really important to me. I don't know if that answers your question. You look skeptical. Well. I am a bit mm -hmm. skeptical, mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a strong proponent of the use of narrative in looking at ethical aspects of one's life. Uh, I like the voices, and I think that this is one small piece, maybe, mm -hmm. of that larger puzzle, but to me, it's still the voices of those that gives us the, the flesh on the bone. So I, I, I don't disagree with the, the power of narrative, right? I'm a lit person. Um, my challenge is that I legally cannot give you those voices. Okay, and that was my question. Did, was there any thought to pursuing records from the court system? Because I know the story of Matilda, which came out of California mm -hmm. back in 1929, at the height of the crash and all mm -hmm. that, she fought sterilization mm -hmm. and it went to court. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is another place with testimony mm -hmm. on the records, unless someone willfully destroys them. I grant you that mm -hmm. what happened in Carolina. Well, so, you know, I mean, I think that one of the things that I'm trying to explore, so on the one hand, I would say, yes, those stories are very important, 
right? Mm -hmm. And there are people who are writing them, and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Alex Stern's book, mm -hmm. Eugenic Nation, mm -hmm. does a fair mm -hmm. amount of this, right? Um, and No Mas Bebes is, is a more contemporary version where people are actually still alive to give their first person mm -hmm. accounts. Um, what concerns me is the stand-in of a single individual <coughs> for a much 20,000 people that we know of, right? That's a lot of people. Um, the way that, that or a, an individual or a composite can stand in for the totality of that, for the diversity of those experiences, is difficult for me. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to get rid of that, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't yeah. want to not have this as my only avenue under HIPAA to make those 19,999 other records present in some way, if that makes sense. I certainly, yeah, I understand. It's, I'm money more lush. If that's about it. Well, this and, and this is a, a challenge, right? Like, it, w I think we we want full-bodied, as you said, fleshy mm -hmm. pictures. Um, and what do we do when we can't have them, right? That's you know, how do we edit the missing? How do we edit the, the regulated out? Um, I think this is my attempt to, to try to wrangle with that. Thank you. No, we can use de-identified data. Like we can use de-identified data. We can use pseudonyms. Pseudonyms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can do that. So what's wrong with using that to achieve this narrative? Right? You know. So there's nothing wrong with it. I think my sense of, and, and that's what historians of science have been doing, right? right? And these stories have been written, um, the, at least some of them. The, the composite model necessarily offers a, a limited slice as representative of a very large body of experience, which I think is a limitation, not necessarily a thing that means that it has to be tossed out. I wouldn't toss it out. I'm just saying this might be an alternative window in. And I'll just pursue the traditional point of view too a little more. What, do you say anything wrong with the traditional presentation of presenting tables and charts and graphs very effective to me I mean I trained in this these techniques these are very effective techniques for me of visualizing how much you know how much of it how much happened and how many people were affected and to what degree I mean there are clear ways of doing that visually and so I think we do learned you feel that somehow not not sufficient that you want to do the uh, the oral and haptic approaches or do you see something so the visual is dominant for a reason, because it's effective, right? And compelling. I think there's something for me about the all at onceness of the visual that requires a different kind of presence, right? So what it takes to stand here for you know 110 seconds um, and be with this data is different than if I put up a, a slide with a graphic that you could look at and take in all at once that had all 57 years of data and all of the people, right? There's something about time that I think is important. As a person who's interested in, um, you know, I mean, in some ways this is a story, right, of bodies that were fundamentally uncared for um, and violated, right? Um, there's something about creating space in my body through touch to to sit with that for a little bit right to it, i don't think it i don't think it undoes the violence right that happened in the past but i think it it there's a certain kind of justice um, a certain kind of i'm not quite sure what the word is that i'm looking for but there's a certain kind of care expressed in that so i think the i wouldn't get rid of the visual I think tables are good, numbers are good, but I do think there's something about the regime of counting, right, that, that does a certain kind of work and that we might want to look at other modes um, in addition to those. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's interesting about this idea is that you take, I mean, data, not all data are the same as data, mm -mm. whatever you want to, however you want to call it, and so you take this data that 
is very embodied. I mean, it comes from bodies, mm -hmm. then becomes disembodied mm -hmm. in terms of numbers, right? You could say 20,000 people, and then you re-embody it um, through our own <coughs> bodies with this kind of haptic. <coughs> and so I think, and so in terms of we were talking a lot about narrative, you know, and so I think in this process of disembodiment, um, or body embodiment, disembodiment, embodiment, there is a narrative that's happening there mm -hmm. that is not necessarily being told by, it, it, they're not, it's not a personal narrative about a person, but it's a narrative about the process of, right. of, of what happens to a group of people when they become disembodied in mm -hmm. the form of data. Mm -hmm. And so I think it works really well for a project like about forced sterilization. And I'm wondering if you have thought about this method in terms, other forms of data, you know, so data that's maybe not embodied to begin with. Well, so I think um, one of the things that Jessica and I have been working on, um, it, it, we've sort of been circling around this idea, right, that there is no data without people, mm -hmm. right? Like, it just doesn't happen, right? So there's always bodies. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of my commitment as a, a feminist scholar, right, is to say that even if we're talking about, like, planetary objects, somebody's <coughs> doing that data recording, right? So there are always bodies. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that there's, um, there's something about like the narrative of how we value things mm -hmm. and w where information lies vis-a-vis -vis bodies. So one of the other things that we've been working on in, in Vibrant Lives was thinking about um, data shed. So how much this device is constantly spewing out data even though I'm not doing anything. And that was actually the first instance in which we used the Woojers was we hooked it, we created an app, um, we hooked it up to the phone and then we hooked it up to a Wooger and we had people feel how much data their phone is putting out at any given moment. Right? Because it's, it's largely invisible, right? Like you don't know that my phone, Wendy Chun calls this promiscuity of, of devices, right? You don't know that it's mm -hmm. talking to all kinds of things right now, right? But it is, right? Um, and similarly with that computer, right? Anything that's hooked up to the internet is constantly in this kind of informational data dialogue. Um, and it, a, a vast amount of data is just sort of like shedding around me everywhere. So we used those as a way of, of bringing that awareness back to people's bodies, right? That you are literally shedding this data at this very moment. Mm -hmm. On this uh, other project, the sterilizations, how many characteristics do you envision putting into a single sonification? So you have four now. Um, right, so I um, have been working with a sound artist um, who developed um, a, a piece of software for me that will sonify the entire data set as a means of exploring it rather than presenting it. Um, it turns out that human bodies can identify patterns um, orally much faster than they can by looking at data. Um, so I haven't had much time to dig into that. That only came through in December. Um, but we have that sonification tool that can handle all 20,000 uh, individuals, or you know, it's 30,000 records, and all 212 individual fields. So it can handle the entire database. Because I'm envisioning a symphony that's created you based could. upon the um, data set. Mm -hmm. It's entirely possible. I am not a musician, um, so I would have to work with and a one musician. Would not envision a symphony. <laughs> one would, you know, yeah. imagine rather than envision. I don't know. Well, yeah. Sound. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I mean, I think there's a lot that's possible there. I've also um, Alex Stern and I had talked about the possibility of an opera. Right? She has a, a friend who's a librettist um, who's sort of interesting in, in doing something with this. So I think there's a lot of possibility. And that would do a very interesting thing of bringing together the sonic with the narrative, right? Because we would be able to use some things for the score um, and for singing parts that we couldn't use in other spaces. Um, so there's lots of possibilities, I think. Yeah. Yeah, these uh, last comments are very much in the vein of what I've been thinking about this, if you bear with me for a second. Of course. Um, uh, there's a, a there's a, a light artist in Arizona, I apologize, I can't remember his name, but probably many of you know him, uh, who creates the Gans Field. Uh, there's one of those that's been at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, I think that uh, some humans are more visual, some mm -hmm. are more auditory, uh, some maybe more tactile, who take in information differently. I find it easier to access information through non-visual mm -hmm. uh, means often. Um, and, and so I would like a symphony, something like a Gansfeld, that might be driven by data mm -hmm. or responding to the data. 
But that gets us into the area of art, mm -hmm. which I don't understand you to be working in. Forgive me about I'm a, uh, a lay person, mm -hmm. a community member, so. Um, and there's a place for that, but it seems to me it also raises the question of politics. Mm -hmm. Because, um, and, and that would be one for you to wrestle with. You know, could you be criticized, it doesn't matter, uh, for for choosing, whereas an artist would be free <coughs> to choose certain tones to go along with certain pieces mm -hmm. of paper. Um, whereas, would it would it possibly cause your your research to be questioned if you go too far in, in the direction of trying to make it a persuade persuasion mm -hmm. rather than a representation of okay this this happened and as a as a how do you wrestle with those issues? I'm sorry for bleeding so much out. No, it's it's an interesting question, right? And I think, you know, one of the things, part of the reason that I like this work is because it allows me to explore where affect, how affect has a place in critical scholarship, right? Um, and I think um, part of my commitment is to say that affect is important, right? Emotion is important. Um, I think... Uh, there's something, we ought to be disturbed by this, right? I wouldn't want to sanitize it in some way and make it, and I, I also, you know, I wouldn't, as a, a historian of sorts, I don't tend to think that there is a single true perspective on a story, right? Um, so I'm not gonna offer it as pure fact, right? And so there's, I think one of the things that I'm trying to play with, and this is something that we're doing in the HS Collab, is thinking about where, um, where performance, where art, where making, right, things that feel less critical and academic actually m may offer us some real purchase on these problems, um, including coming up with creative ways of engaging with things that, that regulations are prohibiting us from doing. Now I'll say, as you were talking, um, thinking about, you know, if I, let's say we hypothetically make a symphony or a, a, a opera out of this and like, you know, it has a big debut in Los Angeles, if I were to never engage with the communities who are impacted by this, that would, that would be unethical as far as I'm concerned, right? Um, I wouldn't want to be the person who swooped in and used a data set that is deeply sensitive as the occasion for my art, right? As, as a kind of um, instrumental use, right? Um, so I think part of what I like about this is that it asks people to come together and to think about it as a group and how we might engage with it rather than me saying, here, I'm gonna give this thing to you, you know, aren't you happy, um, if that makes sense. If I could mention one other example. Mm -hmm. In the Holocaust Museum, mm -hmm. the shoes. Mm -hmm. They're powerful, well, right? I think yeah. one of the things that we're looking at in particular, so my background is events and digital media. I do a lot of interactive participatory design work in this kind of area, and this is why we work together, and sort of we, we have this kind of dialogue. But one of the things that we're looking at is not just to sort of organize, and this is what's happening here, is like a short case study, is to organize things temporally and say that, that that's the best way to look at something this large, but is to, how do we sort of like fill a space with data in a way that allows people to, to, to traverse it themselves? Mm -hmm. So if we're to spatialize things differently, then giving people who are experiencing that information the agency to then explore, and how that changes the way in which we, as someone who's making this, changes the conversation about, look what I've shown you, and say, what do you think about this? Because one of the things we found with this type of participatory art making is that if we give a little bit of agency to the person who's experiencing it, it opens up a line of conversation that may not be there if I said, I have the information for you. And so what is it like to experience something in a way that's not seen as informational, but experiential, is a way to open to a, a door to a deeper conversation, especially looking at people who may not be aware, as many are, about what this information is, may not even understand why they should care. I think that's a very real thing that mm -hmm. we need to understand. And then how does this sort of open up pathways of knowing that may not be available in more traditional modes of sharing information? Is your end goal, though, still to bring some sense of influence on public policy to make sure this doesn't happen again? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and I'm being very practical now, okay, nothing, it's okay, just like government can really 
well, never mind. It's a political season. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but how does that get translated so that people hear? I, and I guess what I'm wondering is, having one thing or two things, it, it's like something is missing. These need to be presented in its contextual whole in order to truly experience what you're wanting, I think, at least in my mind. I would, I'm much more, I want the whole. I want to understand from every angle possible, not just one wire. Sure, right. I mean, so if we think about this as a prototype, right, like just a, an early exploration, um, one of the things that I would observe about what you're saying is that I hear a desire to know more, mm -hmm. which is precisely what I would want. Right? Um, if, if you were like, wait, I need to know more about this, then I've done a lot, actually, right? Um, and, and maybe it's because you're frustrated with, you know, like haptics and the wire or whatever, it just doesn't seem satisfying. Um, but if that's the case, then I've opened up a space, right? And I think sometimes didactic modes deposit information and people go away and they're like, okay, I know about it, and now I'm done, right? So I had one person say to me that she felt doubly implicated after experiencing this. And I said, why? And she said, because now not only do I know, right, but my fingertip is buzzing, so I know in my body that this happened, and I'm going to walk away and still do nothing about it, right? Because she has a life and things to do and scholarship to produce, et cetera, right? And so, you know, if there's a certain kind of weight that an experience can bring, and when we're talking, you know, so Safe Harbor as a, an idea right now would use this along, I mean, it's, it's, it's imagined as like a two-month installation in a warehouse full of things with lots of different modalities, whether they be sonic, haptic, narrative, whatever, right, um, that would create a kind of um, community of investment and knowledge that would then, I think, be very powerful when you're talking about political action, right? I mean, if, if we, in fact, are able to get this into a space in Los Angeles, and we have a huge community come in, huge, relatively, to experience it, right? I mean, as opposed to, say, a 30-page article? That I'd love to know what would happen if you were to make this available, say, to our state legislators. Let them experience mm -hmm. this and see what effect, if any, mm -hmm. this might. I mean, well, and this is, so my, Alexandra Stern at Michigan is, took this, one of the spaces that she works in is the, the um, medical school, and she took it to epidemiologists, right, and public health people, right, and, and for them, they're like, whoa, wait, like, eh, this is very strange, like, we normally just do charts, that's all we do, right, and, and it then, I think it did exactly this thing that Jessica's talking about, right, it fostered a different kind of conversation right. that, at the very least, opens up a space. Thank you very much, Jackie. We really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um,